I won't lean on it. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. You can hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. And a, a public service reminder to put your phones on mute or whatever um, so as to not dis disturb the program or embarrass yourself because that's happened to me more than once. I'm Erlene Rosofsky. I'm uh, uh, wanting to welcome you to a very exciting program this afternoon um, along with my colleagues and friends, uh, Margaret uh, Pantridge and Sue Kessner and Judy Sachs and Carol Abergast and Janice Bowen, who has put out some refreshments in the back, um, and others from uh, the program committee of the Friends of the Public Library. Uh, we welcome you and are so happy the weather gods have been with us today. It would have been uh, really scary and unfortunate if we had to change it again. Before we um, get started, I want to put out a little uh, advanced teaser for our next program, which is also a very exciting program. They all are. Um, and it will be held on, sad on Sunday at 2 o'clock on February 4th, right here, same place, just a different date. And the title of that is The Embrace. So uh, the speaker is going to be the uh, director of the uh, Embrace Pro Embrace Boston program, Dr. Imari Paris Jeffries. Many of you heard him as well as I did this past week on GBH. He's a terrific speaker and a, an important person. Um, most of us are familiar with the Embrace statue, um, the Martin Luther King Jr. Embrace Memorial. And uh, when Dr. Jeffrey presents, he'll be talking about that, as well as the role of culture and the arts and the support of it um, in Boston and environs. Um, I think you're going to find him a delightful speaker and the topic will be most wonderful. Um, we know that the, the statue uh, speaks mostly about um, the relationship between Reverend King, tomorrow's Martin Luther King Day, yeah, just under me, and his wonderful wife, Coretta Scott King. Um, but it also has become a real icon for the city, and it will be a, a, a timely and wonderful uh, presentation. Now on to today's presentation, Successful Brain Aging, Understanding the Latest Science. I'm excited about doing this particular event and particular introduction. Um, as some of you know, I'm a, a geropsychologist, which means I do research and clinical work, and I'm a professor of clinical psychology with an emphasis on the aging brain. So now that I've accrued enough years as a teacher, about 40 years, um, I would say that I'm living the dream. <laughs> All the stuff I was telling my students over the years, has been accurate. Things really, really do change. Uh, wouldn't you know it? It's really true stuff. Um, as a lot happens, as we know, as go through the life course. But one thing that happens as an overarching theme is that the brain and the mind um, gets more tightly connected with the body and with one's feelings and emotions too. The brain is always connected, um, over the, but over the life course as an older person, it becomes more um, importantly enmeshed. Um, today's speaker, Dr. Maureen O'Connor, is a, a warm colleague of mine. Our paths have crossed for a number of years, although Maureen is considerably younger than I am. Um, she's a neuropsychologist and the director of the neuropsychology program at the Bedford, Bedford VA Hospital and assistant professor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine. She's a prolific researcher and has co-authored two books well received by both lay audiences and uh, professional readership as well. A challenge is challenging task, I know that very well. Um, but Just Out is a revision of the first uh, book that she wrote with uh, Dr. Andrew Budson, who's also a colleague of mine, only more my age <laughs> than Maureen. And um, we cannot 
we were not able to secure coffee, copies of it um, to give you today for supply chain reasons. Don't you love that, supply chains? But um, you will be getting a notification how you can get it from the uh, library, the Wellesley Library, um, not the Wellesley Library, the Wellesley Bookstore that will be happy to, when they receive it, get it to you. So look for it in, in your email. Um, if my students, who are basically in their 20s, came home and couldn't find their car keys and looked all over the house and finally found them in the freezer in the kitchen, they might have thought, boy, I must have had a really good night last night when I was out with my friends. If someone older can't find their car keys and they look all around and they finally find it in the freezer in their kitchen, they're likely to get worried and say something to themselves like, could this be an early sign? Uh, there, there is a difference. In today's presentation, Dr. O'Connor is going to talk to us about what normal age-related changes occur, lifestyle factors that can boost brain health, and how attitudes about aging can affect the way we think, feel, and function. Um, she'll talk about ageism. Ageism in a positive skew and a negative skew, it's both. And stereotypes, how those define and in uh, our perceptions of aging, and then how our perceptions of aging informs our experience of the aging experience, and even on longevity. So lots of information. I'm going to uh, watch the time to make sure that we have plenty of time left for questions and answers, because I anticipate there will be plenty. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I present our speaker, Dr. Maureen O'Connor. Hi, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and for spending some of your Sunday uh, with me. Um, so I'm gonna try to get through a lot today and chances are we won't get through everything that I'd like to say, um, but we do want to have enough time for, for questions. So uh, so we'll see, we'll see where the day takes us. Okay, so a couple things that we're gonna try uh, uh, to do. So I'd like to start just by explaining how the brain changes in normal aging so that we're all sort of on the same page, sort of understanding what to expect normally as we get older. Uh, then I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, all of the different lifestyle factors that we now appreciate contribute to how well our brain ages. Uh, and I might sort of touch very briefly on the role of um, memory strategies and compensatory techniques. All right. So we're going to start with uh, understanding how the brain how the brain ages, and to do that, I want to introduce Helen. So uh, this is Helen at 109 years old. Helen was interviewed by NPR uh, a number of years ago, and at the time, she was happily living in the community, independently. Uh, she said her favorite beverage was Budweiser beer, uh, although I'm not endorsing Budweiser beer uh, as the, the secret to, to longevity. Uh, her favorite food was chocolate truffles. And, you know, I think that this is really how people would like to age, remaining uh, independent. Uh, Helen had no signs that she had a, a cognitive impairment or, or dementia uh, of any sort. And so so, you know, we're going to explore how we might be able to do things differently in our everyday life to help us to age more, more like Helen. 
Uh, you know, it turns out that the U.S. has the most individuals over the age uh, of 100 uh, uh, compared to any other country. Uh, these are some individuals over 100 years old from Boston University Centenarian study. And one finding that I thought was very interesting from that study is that it seems as if if you make it to 100, your chances of successfully aging uh, beyond 100 increase. So people that tend to make it to 100 tend to stay relatively sort of cognitively sharp and, and independent. Uh, and it turns out that many of us will be uh, living into our 80s, 90s, and 100s, many more than, than ever before. So when do, do our brains begin to age? This is a very busy slide. I'll sort of orient you to this slide. The data suggest that our brains begin to age earlier than we might expect, in about our 20s and 30s. And that these uh, changes in brain aging uh, accelerate over time. And so what you're seeing here are, uh, for, this was a, a seminal study that was conducted by a researcher called Timothy Salthaus. And you see four different domains of cognition. So we have uh, memory, your ability to you know, learn and remember information, your ability to reason or problem solve, uh, to visualize things accurately in space, and to think quickly. And what you can see is from age 20 to 60, which is plotted out here, that all of these abilities decline over time. And if you extended that line out, you, you would see uh, additional, additional declines. So earlier than we might think. And these changes in memory and thinking occur because there are some very predictable structural and functional changes in our brains as we get older. So there are declines in the size of our brains. Our brains tend to atrophy over time. They become a little bit smaller over time. And the front part of our brains, the frontal lobes, are the most affected by the normal aging process. This is the part of our brains that help us to do things like multitask, uh, plan, problem solve. The hippocampus is the memory center of our brain. And the hippocampus is also affected by normal aging, but much less so than in diseases of aging like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then there are some changes in the integrity of white matter pathways. Those uh, can be thought of as sort of the highways that allow information to flow from one area of our brains to another. Uh, this uh, kind of change can, can uh, sort of slow us down as, as we get older. So uh, that people may feel like their thinking is a little bit slower. They sort of take a little bit longer to do things or to process information. And there are some alterations in the way that uh, our resting blood flow gets to the brain, our brain oxygen consumption, and these types of things. And so these changes result in some characteristic uh, declines in memory and thinking. So as I said, people say that they might feel a little bit uh, less sharp, a little bit uh, slower as they age, that it might take them longer to do things. There are declines in uh, something that we call selective attention, so our ability to pay attention to what we want to pay attention to and sort of drown out distractors, ignore distractors. Uh, there are changes in divided attention, so being able to do more than one thing at the same time. Uh, working memory decline. So the best example of working memory is going into a, a store, getting up to the cashier, and being able to mentally calculate how much change you're, you're going to get back. Uh, there are some changes in our ability to plan and to self-initiate uh, strategies for how we're going to approach a, a particular task. It may take us a little bit longer to think through the best strategy for, for approaching a novel task. Episodic memory is just what it sounds like. It's our memory for uh, episodes in our life, things like you know what we did this morning, uh, what we had for dinner last night. And as we get older, there are some declines in our ability to learn new information, to sort of take in all of the details of the episodes of our life, uh, and also to retrieve that information later when we need it. But what we'll see on the next slide is that our ability to hold on to the information that we get in stays relatively stable as, as we get older. So I'm going to ask you all a, a question. Uh, so I want to know how many of you have ever been in this situation. 
You walk into a room, maybe, you know, even the room that, that we're in right now, and you see somebody that you know you know. So it sounds like maybe already some of you know where I'm going with this. And, uh, and maybe that person is walking towards you and they're getting closer and you know they're gonna say hi and you know that you should know their name or you feel that you should know their name and that you'd like to greet them by name but you can't remember their name. And so if you're anything uh, uh, like me, sometimes uh, I, you know, instead of just saying, I I've forgotten your name, I'm so sorry, I'll say something like, hey, you, you know, and try to, to sort of work around it. Uh, and and uh, maybe later on, you know, maybe even just a couple of minutes later, you'll be like, oh, that was, you know, so-and-so. So just by a show of hands, I, I, you know, I think you guys are resonating with this, but just by a show of hands, so how many of you? Okay, so there's a couple of you that didn't raise your hands, and I don't know if I believe you. So... <laughs> So, so this type of difficulty, this difficulty uh, retrieving the names of people, uh, people you know that maybe we don't see so often, actors, the names of movies, uh, this experience increases as we as we get older, and then there are changes in something called prospective memory. So our ability to remember that we need to do something in the future, like make a phone call or or take a medication. And so, you know, I sort of uh, hinted that there are areas of stability or um, even improvement in aging. So sustained attention, our ability to uh, pay attention over time remains relatively unaffected by the aging process. Procedural memory, things like playing a piano or riding a bike, uh, also remains relatively unaffected by aging and even remains relatively unaffected in diseases of aging like Alzheimer's disease until later on in, uh, in the disease process. And then as I shared, our retention, our ability to hold on to information that we learn remains relatively intact. And semantic memory, which is our memory for things like vocabulary and facts actually increases across the lifespan as we continue to, to accrue knowledge. The problem, uh, and I think Erlene nicely sort of talked about this, is that these types of normal changes can be misunderstood. And people can worry when they can't come up with a name of somebody that they think they should know, or they you know, find their keys in the freezer, that uh, these types of changes might be the beginning of a brain disease, something like Alzheimer's disease or, or another form of dementia. And I think that the media can unintentionally sort of fuel some of this fear and, and anxiety uh, by using these, these scary headlines. So these are all real, real headlines calling dementia an epidemic looming or saying there's a dementia time bomb warning or a dementia crisis. Uh, and sometimes, you know, these types of articles don't really do a good job at explaining what might be normal and, and you know, what might be worrisome. So these individuals wind up in my office uh, as a neuropsychologist. So I see uh, individuals who have experienced some change in memory and thinking. They're worried about whether that change is normal or not. Uh, I will administer a battery of different tests of memory and thinking to see if that person is performing where I would expect them to relative to peers their same age with similar, with similar backgrounds. And often what I find is that, uh, you know, these folks are are doing uh, well. They sort of look the same as their, as their same age peers. And I'm not concerned that there's any decline in memory and thinking. And so we spend a lot of time during feedback for those folks talking about how they can keep their brains healthy. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. But we're not, we're not quite through yet. So you know, this brings us back to Helen. And I think a really good question that, uh, that we should ask is, well, you know, maybe Helen's just lucky or maybe she's just genetically blessed. And, you know, and I think that that is a fair question that we need, to, we need to address. There's some truth to that. So this is Helen with her younger brother, Irving, who is 107 years old uh, and is himself a successful ager. So how much did genetics really tell us about successful aging? 
It turns out that heritability influences are greatest for individual differences in cognition. So you may just be genetically blessed with a much better memory than I am. But the change in what happens to memory and thinking as we age is better determined by environmental factors than genetic factors. So what are these factors? Genetics absolutely, absolutely plays a role. But then there's also things like sleep and exercise, diet, uh, brain games, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how, how we socialize with others, and then something I call the mind-brain connection that I'll explain. And we're gonna try to get through all of, all of those things, or as many as we can. Um, so I'm gonna start with sleep. So uh, this is my dad, who is uh, in his 60s at my daughter's third birthday party. And this is probably, you know, around two or, or three. Uh, and my dad's a pretty, a pretty you know, tough uh, Irish guy, former, former Marine. And you can see here that there's a real difference in energy level. <laughs> so, so my daughter, she's like gonna keep going, uh, and my dad is is ready is ready for a nap. Uh, and this is you know my excuse to show one of my favorite pictures of of the two of them. So so there are some you know normal changes that occur uh, with sleep as as we get older. And um, what you're looking at here is a hypnogram. So this is sort of a, a visual depiction of the sleep cycle between a, a young person uh, and an older person. And I, I'm just gonna, you know, rather than sort of walk you through the image, I'm just gonna describe some of what this image uh, shows us. So, so uh, the first thing is that uh, it takes the older person, you see there's sort of no activity uh, at the beginning of the older person uh, hypnogram for longer compared to the younger person. It takes individuals as they age longer to fall asleep than it does uh, people that are younger. Uh, in addition, you see some black bars there. There are many more of them for the older adult. And that's because older adults have many more nighttime awakenings, even if they're just very brief compared to people that are younger. Uh, they also have less REM sleep. Uh, this is the red bars there and uh, less of you know, the blue color that you that you might see, which is uh, deep sleep. And that's important because we now sort of appreciate that during deep sleep and getting restorative sleep is really how we consolidate memories or sort of solidify the memories that we make during, during the day. And so some of these normal changes in sleep may be uh, one explanation for some changes that occur in memory as we, as we get older. There's also an increased prevalence of sleep disorders as we age. So older adults are more likely to experience insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, a sleep disordered breathing that can range from the mild end, sort of a little bit of snoring, uh, to the uh, uh, sort of extreme end, uh, which is things like sleep apnea. Uh, there are also increases in something called REM sleep behavior disorder, where people may act out their dreams, be a little bit more restless at night, uh, and then restless leg syndrome, which is, uh, you know, sort of an uncomfortable feeling in one's, one's legs, restlessness in one's legs that may keep people up. And so uh, the thing that's important to understand here is that when you're experiencing a sleep problem, you're also not going to think as clearly during the day. So there can be changes in memory and thinking. You're ability to pay attention, your ability to think quickly, that are due to difficulties sleeping. So in my office, I often see people who I think, after testing them and looking at how they're doing on tests, that the complaints that they're coming to me with are really due to poor sleep. And so we have to work really hard on helping those people to try to achieve optimal sleep. And that means about seven to nine hours of, of sleep a night. Uh, so we do this by providing some sleep hygiene education for the sake of time. I'm not gonna go through all of these things. Uh, we also refer our patients to cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Uh, that's a very effective treatment for insomnia. Insomnia. And then there may be times where our patients need to take medication. 
And I will tell you that we like to try other things before uh, we sort of work with providers to move toward medication, because some of the sleep medications that are out there can not only interfere with memory and thinking in the short term, people may feel a little bit hungover, a little bit uh, sort of groggy after, uh, after waking up using a sleep medication, uh, but there's also some research to suggest that they can make us more susceptible to developing diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So if we can try to stay away from sleep medications, we do, there's, you know, there's a balance. I mean, people also need, need to sleep, and there's uh, that recognition as well. Uh, there are, you know, are some treatments for sleep disordered breathing. This um, continuous positive airway pressure machine up there is the most common. You can see that it's a little bit clunky. People usually don't like to use it. What I say to people that have sleep apnea diagnoses that have been prescribed the CPAP machine but are finding it difficult to use uh, is that we can actually see on pictures that are taken of the brain uh, positive benefits from CPAP. So individuals that have sleep apnea that's untreated have little changes in the brain that you can see on, uh, on imaging, these pictures that are taken of the brain. When they adhere to CPAP for a full year, those little changes go away. So um, real important to wear that CPAP if you, if you have one. And then there are some other ways to address sleep apnea with weight reduction, uh, changing sleep position. We actually had one clever patient uh, that would sew golf balls into the back of his pajamas so that when he rolled over, it was uncomfortable and he trained himself to sleep on his side, which is preferable for, uh, for sleep apnea. Um, you know, uh, stopping smoking and reducing alcohol consumption. So, you know, just some final thoughts. Really, the bottom line here is that there are some sleep changes that are normal. If difficulties with sleep interfere with your daytime functioning, that's a sleep disorder. That can cause changes in memory and thinking that can look like dementia. So it's really important to talk to your health care providers uh, about getting some sort of treatment if you're having sleep difficulties. So exercise is probably one of my favorite things to talk about because if there were any, uh, you know, sort of magic potion to help keep our brains healthy as we age, it, it would be exercise. So, so let's talk a little bit more about, about why exercise is so important for our brain's health. So the first reason is that exercise improves our cardiovascular health. So uh, it improves the ability of blood to flow through our body. It reduces diseases like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol. And these are all things that put our brains at risk for stroke, uh, or for uh, small changes uh, in the brain that accumulate over time and can cause problems with memory and thinking. Uh, so this is one sort of way that exercise helps protect our brains. Exercise also keeps us physically healthy. It helps to reduce the risk of falls. It reduces back pain, speeds recovery from back injuries, reduces muscle and joint pain, improves sleep, which we know is so important now, and helps us to maintain a, a healthy weight. So other indirect benefits to, to our brain. And then exercise improves our emotional health. So it improves mood, decreases depression and anxiety, helps people cope with stress. It can be a means of socialization, and we'll find out in just a second how important that is for us as we get older and is for our brains. Uh, it can increase self-esteem and provide people with a sense of accomplishment, a sense of purpose and, and meaning in life. But the thing that's really interesting is that exercise can have a direct impact on the health of our brains. So when I started graduate school, we used to think that we were born with a certain number of neurons in our brains, and as we aged, those neurons died, and, and that was just it. There was sort of nothing that, that we could do about it. Uh, and now, you know, over the last 20 years, we really appreciate that we can continue to grow new neurons in our brain as we get older. And one of the best ways to do that is through exercise. We know that exercise increases our capacity for learning. We know that people that exercise have better memory, uh, ability to problem solve, plan, multitask. Exercise strengthens connections between existing brain cells so information can flow faster, our brains can work more efficiently. And there, there is no fail-proof way to prevent ourselves from getting dementia, from getting Alzheimer's disease. But 
Uh, you know, so, so I guess what I'll say about that is that you know, sometimes I have people in my office and they don't test normally. And their testing looks more consistent with somebody that has a brain disease, something like Alzheimer's disease or, or another form of dementia. And sometimes those people will say, you know, I don't understand. I did everything the right way. I exercised, I, I ate right. Uh, you know, why is this happening to me? And, you know, there may be this sort of element of, of self-blame. But one of the conversations that we have is, you know, actually, it's more likely that all of these healthy lifestyle habits that you've been doing have, uh, allowed you to sort of make it here, that you would have developed something like Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia maybe five years earlier, 10 years earlier. So even if you experience some decline in memory and thinking, if you're doing these things, we know that you will experience that decline typically later in life and less often compared to individuals that are not engaging in these healthy lifestyle habits. And that includes, that includes exercise. The other important thing about exercise that we now appreciate is when I was talking about that growth of new neurons, those new neurons tend to grow specifically in our memory centers. Uh, so this, the area of the brain that is uh, susceptible to diseases of, of aging. And this was a study, this just sort of uh, illustrates the point that I was just making. So in this study, there were 120 normal older adults that were randomized to either engage in uh, exercise, and you know that leads me to a point. When I say exercise, what do I mean? Uh, with this body of research, I really mean aerobic activity, uh, something cardiovascular activity, something that gets our you know hearts beating a little bit more rapidly, you know maybe has us breathing a little bit, sweating a little bit, uh, and. So in this study, it was one year of aerobic exercise versus stretching. And what these researchers found was that after just one year of engaging in aerobic exercise consistently, and we'll sort of talk about the recommendations for how much exercise you should be getting, these individuals saw increases in their memory centers, the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain, that was equal to about one to two year reversal of age-related decline. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. And uh, I think the other thing that this study helps us to appreciate is that it's never too late to start. Even if you know, you're sitting here today and you're sort of thinking, oh, well, maybe I should start exercising. You know, I've never exercised before. Even if you're sedentary, it's never too late to start exercising and see the benefits to, to your brain. Uh, this is just some more data saying the same thing. Um, this is uh, an interesting piece of, of data that we uh, have gotten from a review of a number of different studies. So these researchers looked at 19 different studies to really try to help us understand the benefits of exercise to the brain. And what they were interested in was understanding whether exercise would be of benefit just to individuals whose brains were normally aging, or could it also benefit people who are already maybe experiencing some cognitive decline, such as people people with mild cognitive impairment, meaning that they have some changes in memory and thinking that are uh, a little bit different compared to same age peers, or even individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And what these researchers found was that across the 19 studies that they looked at, for individuals that were already showing some change in memory and thinking, the impact of exercise was was there, and that it was greatest for those showing the greatest amount of decline. So what this means is that the people that seemed to need it most and could benefit the most were showing the greatest gains related to exercising. And in people that had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, exercise was found to be as effective as some of the medications that can improve memory and thinking in that group. So really powerful stuff supporting exercise. 
The sad truth is people, people don't exercise enough, uh, and older adults tend to not exercise enough. And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, they have health conditions that prevent them from exercising. We usually say, we want you to see our physical therapist. We want you to see our recreational therapist. There's something that everybody can do that is a form of exercise. Uh, maybe they have difficulties getting someplace to exercise. Uh, we also know that when a doctor prescribes exercise, people are more likely to, to do it. And then some people just say, I didn't really realize how good exercise was for, for me. Uh, we all, you know, sort of have a vague sense that exercise is good for you, but, you know, we may not appreciate how good for you and exactly why it's, why it's good for you. And uh, so before I, before I leave the, the exercise piece, um, you know, so what does it mean to, to exercise? How much exercise is good for us? So the current recommendation for aerobic exercise is 150 minutes a week. So uh, five days a week. 30 minutes a day. And that can be broken up if needed. So that can be, you know, in 10 minute increments. We also see brain benefits when that, uh, when that 30 minutes is broken up. And what I'm talking about here really is intentional exercise. So sometimes when I see people in my office and I ask about exercise, they say, oh, well, sure, you know, I go grocery shopping, you know, I run to CVS, and, you know, I take the dog out a little bit, you know, maybe not for a vigorous walk, but, you know, out to the... And, and that's not really what I mean. What I mean is purposefully engaging in aerobic activity, you know, taking a, and this does also doesn't mean that you need to run marathons, but, you know, taking a, a brisk walk, uh, going swimming, taking a Zumba class, uh, some uh, intentional form, form of exercise. There is also a place for strength training and flexibility training. So there are also recommendations that we should be engaging in strength training and flexibility training about two, two days a week. Uh, but those things don't seem to have the same direct benefit to, to the brain. There's other reasons that those things are good for our brain. So, uh, you know, they may help us with balance, pre preventing falls, head injuries, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but the direct benefits don't, don't seem to be here. So, so that said, uh, there is also some new research coming out that says that we should be remaining active throughout the day even after we've engaged in our intentional exercise. So there are benefits to this, uh, what's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Uh, this is basically just not being sedentary throughout the day. And there's some suggestion that if we go out and we, you know, do our 30 minutes of exercise and it's real sort of vigorous 30 minutes, and then we come home and we sit in front of the TV for the rest of the day, we're kind of undoing that exercise a little bit. It's still better than not doing anything, but we want to try to be moving throughout the day sort of low effort activities. Uh, so, you know, things like parking your car a little bit further away when you're going to the grocery store and maybe walking a, a little bit further. Uh, you know, maybe choosing to go out and get things that you need uh, rather than having people bring them to you or using Amazon delivery. Uh, you know, gardening, uh, you know, um, doing chores uh, around the house. Um, so having a largely sedentary lifestyle even with intentional exercise, uh, can increase the risk of, of cognitive decline. And I think we'll be hearing more about this and, and learning more about this. And these are the recommendations I just went through. And now I'll turn to diet. Uh, so there is no single superfood that's been shown to improve brain health, even though uh, you'll often see these sort of headlines that, you know, eat more kale uh, or, you know, do something, eat something else. That's the new, that's the new thing. But really it turns out that uh, having a well-balanced diet that's comprised of many different foods that we know are healthy for us is best. And so these are foods that are rich in vitamin D and B, uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, uh, found in fish, particularly fatty fish like salmon and tuna, uh, also found in walnuts. Uh, uh, some foods are now fortified with omega-3, so we can look for those in our grocery store. Foods that are high in antioxidant properties, vitamins A, C, and E. Sometimes we tell patients, 
have a colorful diet. Try to have a colorful diet. It's sort of a quick and dirty way to think to yourself, am I getting enough of these, of these nutrients? Uh, there is also no evidence for fish oil or coconut oil. So there are a number of studies that have been done looking at the brain benefits of fish oil and coconut oil, and uh, the research is sort of mixed and has been inconclusive. So we don't recommend those things to, to our patients for, for brain health. But eating fish is good for you. And in fact, when we think about what diet is the best, uh, the Mediterranean diet has been the most well-studied for a, a number of different uh, health-related factors, including brain health. And we have just over and over again seen that the Mediterranean-style diet can help to support our brains. And so what, what does a Mediterranean-style diet look like? So the Mediterranean style diet emphasizes high consumption of fruits and vegetables, particularly green leafy vegetables, whole grains, beans, uh, low consumption of yogurt, cheese, and red meats. Um, also low consumption of saturated fats, uh, so things that we think of as snack foods, packaged, processed snack foods, but encourages consumption of good fats, things found in olive oil, avocado, nuts. And the Mediterranean-style diet also encourages social eating. And we'll talk about how important socialization is. And there are a lot of variations of the Mediterranean-style diet that are out there. So one does not have to follow a Mediterranean diet exactly. Uh, we can sort of make an effort to eat a more Mediterranean-style-like diet, uh, and that has been associated with, uh, with these benefits. Uh, and so he here are just some findings from some research studies that show us that the Mediterranean-style diet is linked to uh, better brain health. Uh, people will ask, what about alcohol? So uh, the current recommendations are one drink or less a day for women and two or less for men, but one a day for anybody over the age of 65. And uh, what we will typically recommend is that if people are drinking within these parameters and they do not have a previous problem with drinking, they, you know, go, go ahead and uh, have your glass, glass of wine a, a day. Uh, but don't start drinking just, you know, for, for aging, just to benefit your brain. And it may sound funny, but we've had a, a, a number of patients in our office who have been like, you know, I make it a point to have a little bit of red wine every day because, you know, I read that it was good for my brain, even though I don't really like it. So, you know, continue if it's no problem. Don't start just for, uh, just for aging. And there is some new research that's mixed. There was actually a, a research study that just came out suggesting that individuals that drink alcohol uh, may be provided with some protective benefits to their brain. Uh, again, not uh, heavily consumption, consuming alcohol, but you know, within these parameters. Um, there was also some research a couple of years ago suggesting that no alcohol is best. So I continue to say to my patients, if you're having one drink a day uh, or less, uh, then you know, go, go ahead and keep doing that uh, if, you, if you are enjoying it. Okay, so you probably have heard a lot online about brain games. Uh, you know, often um, there are advertisements, you know, for brain games that you can play on your phone or on your computer. You know, you can uh, hear these types of advertisements on TV, on the radio. And uh, it turns out that there's really no good evidence that these things work. So people, so what the research tends to show us about engagement in these brain training programs is that people may feel better. So people will say, I've been playing this brain game. It's great. I feel like I'm so much sharper. Uh, so self-report, people sort of feel, feel like their brain is getting better. And they get better at the game that they're playing. So, you know, they have improvements uh, on the game that they're playing. But there's no evidence that this generalizes to the overall health of their brain uh, or generalizes to helping people function better in everyday life. And a number of years ago, the FTC actually fined many of these companies for making unfounded claims that their products improve uh, brain health. So our recommendation has always been to you know, save your money, save your time, and invest in other activities that we know do keep your brains healthy. 
So things like volunteering, coming to lectures here or other places, uh, you know, taking a, taking a class, things that make your brain sort of work a little bit, getting uh, outside of your comfort zone in sort of novel learning situations, going, you know, to museums, going to, to theater, uh, engaging, in, engaging in reading, those types of activities. And as we turn to social function, you know, many of these types of activities are done in, in social settings. And we can appreciate that humans are social, social animals. So there's this cultural intelligence hypothesis of socialization that suggests that humans possess bigger brains specifically so that they can form social groups and socialize. And we know that these social connections are important in childhood. They contribute to who we, who we become in life. It turns out that social, um, social engagement, social connection is just as important as we, as we get older. Uh, for, for older adults, there are uh, some threats to socialization that, that are unique. So the first uh, is role loss. So people uh, may become widows, uh, partners may pass, uh, people may lose friends, they may retire. Uh, sometimes people have a large social network at work and when they retire, they lose that social network. Uh, they may move out of communities that they've lived for many years, losing that social network. Seniors are also the age group most likely to live alone, and 28% of Americans over the age of 65 live alone. Those living below the poverty line are most likely to be isolated. They have less access to uh, social venues, transportation, fewer community resources. And then the baby boomers have lower rates of marriage, higher rates of divorce, and fewer children, so a, a smaller uh, nuclear family. Uh, for, for some of the work that I do at the VA with veterans, veterans as a group tend to have uh, geographic mobility, so they're moving a lot, they have less opportunity to put down roots, uh, and also higher rates of mental health conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, or depression, or other anxiety that makes it difficult for them to form social connections and socialize. But there are many benefits to remaining socially active. So we know that individuals that remain socially active uh, decrease uh, their mortality, uh, they tend to live longer, they are less depressed, less anxious, and they also tend to experience less cognitive decline as they age uh, and less uh, uh, diagnosed dementia. Uh, and so this is uh, just a slide that uh, that shows you some of the studies that have been done in this area. I think I'm going to skip. I've just gotten the 10 minute flash. Uh, so, so what I would say is um, thinking about how we can become more socially active is important. And that can be through engaging in activities like volunteering or thinking about doing some part-time work, engaging with community organizations, uh, visiting with neighbors, taking classes, exercising in social groups, uh, you know, sort of a, a bang for your buck kind of thing. Um, so, you know, trying to think through how can we become more, more social. The other Another thing I'll sort of mention is we don't have to be social butterflies. Uh, so just having uh, social connections that feel meaningful, where you feel sort of connected to other people is, uh, is really what's important here. So this is Otis Clark. Uh, Otis Clark, at 108 years old, um, completed a mission trip to Zimbabwe. And uh, he really credited his successful aging with remaining active and social in his community and, and church. Uh, so I think the last thing I'll try to get through kind of quickly is this mind-brain uh, connection, the importance of a mental mindset. So attitude is a, a little thing that makes a big difference. And this is a quote by Winston Churchill that I think characterizes this sort of body of research that shows us how we think about aging can really contribute to how well we age. So here are some cartoons. So this is the wheels of life. So the wheels of life here start in baby carriage and end in a, a wheelchair. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. This guy says, oh, getting old isn't so bad, except maybe for a little forgetfulness. <laughs> you know, and here he is naked on, a, naked on a bench. So these cartoons are funny, right? They're funny. But they also send a, a particular message about aging, that we're all going to be, you know, frail in a wheelchair someplace or naked on a, a bench someplace as we get older. And it turns out that these types of messages really matter. They can really impact the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we function in the world. 
Older adults tend to believe they'll do less well on memory tasks, that their memory will get worse with age. And what's really important here is that older adults as a group tend to report feeling like they have less control over what happens to their memory as they get older. And I hope that when you leave here today, you feel like you have more control over what happens to your memory as you, as you get older. So there's been some really um, interesting studies that have done in, uh, been done in laboratory settings showing the impact that these stereotypes about aging can have. So they will uh, take a group of older adults, bring them into a room, well, take a group of 100 older adults, uh, separate them, uh, 50 go into one room, 50 go into another room, and in one room the older adults are shown words like decrepit and senile and decline and dementia. And the other group is shown wise and accomplished and sage and guidance. And then they're all given tests of memory and thinking and physical function. And it turns out that the group that sees the negative words about aging consistently do much worse than the group shown the positive words about aging. So just by being shown negative words about aging, that group does worse. And I think that's pretty powerful. And it turns out that in real life, when we follow people with positive and negative attitudes about aging, we see the same sort of thing. Individuals that have more positive attitudes about aging uh, also tend to have less decline in memory and thinking when they're being followed over time and they tend uh, uh, to even live longer, about 7.2 uh, years longer than individuals that have negative views about aging. And the good thing is that we can change attitudes. We, we can cultivate positive attitudes about aging by trying to think of examples of positive agers, like Ellen, uh, Helen, like Otis Clark, uh, that, that uh, you know, we want to sort of bring to mind when we, when we think about aging. So trying to challenge some of the negative stereotypes that we have about aging is important to our brain's health and the way that we function in, in the world. So, so uh, one of the uh, other thing, just trying to think where to go with this. Um, so, so you know, I'll just mention very briefly that one of the other things that uh, that I've developed is a 12-week program called AgeWise that is an hour a week and brings older adults together to learn all of these things that I'm telling you uh, today. Uh, so this is a class where we review what happens with normal aging, uh, all of these lifestyle factors that contribute to successful brain aging, and then uh, we end the class with about three weeks of um, providing practice in strategies that can help to um, uh, sort of minimize some of the normal changes that take place in, in aging. Uh, and this includes internal strategies, teaching people how to use visual images, how to remember names better, um, how to use rhymes, uh, and uh, other sort of uh, uh, tricks, tips, techniques in order to improve memory. Uh, and also external strategies, things like memory aids, using a memory table or a key hook to place all of your things when you come into the house. So you reduce uh, the, the frequency with which you might be misplacing items. Using a pillbox, people can sometimes be very resistant to using a pillbox. They feel like they have their system, you know, they want to use it. Uh, but I think using a pillbox has significant advantages. Uh, one, just being that you can see if you've missed taking a medication, and it's not always so obvious when you're not using a, a pillbox. Uh, we talk to people about using calendars and planners and the best way in which to use those things, making lists, using reminder notes, uh, and then there is just an ever-evolving uh, list of uh, technology uh, that we can use to help to, to keep us uh, independent and, and functioning well in, in everyday life. Um, so I'm going to just bring us back to Helen. So if we want to age more like Helen, we've learned a, a couple of things. We've learned that we should eat a Mediterranean-style diet. And I will tell you, I attended a colleague's talk recently, uh, and one of the things that she said, and I, I thought that this was a great takeaway, is that she was given advice from a dietitian to um, incorporate a serving of spinach and a serving of blueberries to try to meet some of these requirements for green leafy 
few vegetables. Uh, and it's not that, you know, those are magic, magic foods, but I think that they're easily accessible. Uh, and it's sort of easy to like throw blueberries into a smoothie or, you know, throw spinach into whatever it is you're eating. So I, I found that to be a fun, like, you know, trick for being able to get increased greens in your diet. Uh, and, um, and I've actually started doing that, doing that myself. So just a little little tip there. Um, we would say, you know, exercise. Aim for that 150 minutes a week of intentional aerobic activity. Also, don't be sedentary during the day. You know, try to make sure that you're moving, moving around during the day. Socialize. So, you know, get out, take classes, uh, meet new people, uh, make it a point to meet up with friends and family. Uh, we'd say sleep well if you're having problems with sleep. Talk to your treating providers about those problems so that you can get them treated. Uh, stay engaged, keep learning, keep doing things that are interesting that might stretch you outside of your comfort zone. Take classes, learn a new instrument, volunteer, and don't believe in age stereotypes. And I think uh, that I will stop there. So thank you all for, for listening, and I think we'll have some time for, for questions. Lots of information. Wow. Okay. My daughter is here. Lisa, blueberries and spinach. Come up with something. We're going to do that. All right. I, um, I've have a live mic. I want, um, I'll walk around and you can ask questions and Dr. O'Connor will respond to them. Yeah, okay. A friend of mine recently said everybody gets dementia if they live old and live long enough. And I said, that is not true. And then I thought, I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so will everyone get dementia? If that is long? not true. You, you are absolutely correct. No. Uh, so so uh, uh, at around age uh, 80 uh, and, and beyond, uh, about you know, 30 to 40% of people will, will have dementia. So that means that there are more people that will not have dementia as they age uh, than that will. Yeah. So you were right. Okay, that should <laughs> improve your ego, and that's a good thing. I'm feeling more positive about aging now. <laughs> Great. Hi, I appreciate you talk very much. Um, question. Yeah. There's some part of the older population that would prefer a shorter, healthier life as opposed to a longer, less healthy life. Mm -hmm. So strategically, the Canadian government has somewhat recognized that in their medical assistance in dying program mm -hmm. and allowed people to have that before they go into what we call hospice. Mm. And the law is a little fuzzy, but they actually will allow people to get that if they have dementia at mm -hmm. some level, whether it's early stage, mid stage, um, I'm in the latter group, shorter, healthier. Um, have they any, are there any studies about people's strategy? And secondly, what's the cut line between normal aging and you're going into never, never land? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a fair question. Um, so wh what I, would say, and this is a conversation that, you know, I have with patients and their families sometimes, is that these uh, diseases of the brain are typically associated with aging. So, uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia after the age of 65. Uh, and then we have a little bit of increased risk for getting Alzheimer's disease as we get older, uh, as we age from age 65. And, and so, you know, 
even for individuals that receive diagnoses of Alzheimer's disease, uh, often there are many sort of good years that they can live before their problems with memory and thinking become uh, very severe. And because it's a disease of aging, often people pass away from something other than, uh, other than Alzheimer's disease. So uh, I'm not sure then I can answer the question for any single individual person, when do you feel that it is a, a detriment to quality of life for, for you? Uh, but I do think that it's important to understand that if you receive a diagnosis of dementia, it, you know, it's not just like, well, next week, you know, lights out. Next week, you're, you know, you're going to be in a position where you can't do anything for yourself. They're progressive diseases, uh, and I think that we need to look at each day as it comes. Thank you. So that's it. Yes, okay. This is a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really informative. Uh, I have a question about sleep, quality of sleep, and relaxing and having a deeper sleep, but I don't want to take heavy medications. Is there any kind of herbal supplements that you know some research about that you could recommend? Yeah, so we will um, uh, often recommend melatonin for individuals that do not want to take uh, a sleep uh, prescription medication. And that can be very effective. And uh, melatonin is not associated with the same sorts of uh, difficulties that we find with some of these um, prescription medications. So, you know, that may be something to consider. Follow up to that, I have a friend who takes um, cannabis gummies to help her sleep. Is that, is there any data on that? Yeah, that, that is a, a difficult question. I think that that falls into a, we are not entirely sure yet uh, how these types of products affect memory and thinking. And I, I will tell you it is a, a quite a big question for uh, for the people that we see in our clinic, we sort of wonder. We know that uh, for s individuals that smoke marijuana, there can be changes in memory and thinking both acutely, uh, also with long-term chronic use. And so we will often tell people, you know, think carefully about, you know, about the behavior that you're engaging in. Um, it, it's a, a less clear for, for uh, things like gummies, yeah. I just want to add, add to that uh, possibility is that the federal government prohibits research being done about cannabis. Mm. So that's another big reason we don't have that information. Regarding cannabis, the federal government prohibits research regarding cannabis use so we don't have definitive studies about it, its use. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not aware of any, um, you know, uh, prohibiting a, of research. I, I have some colleagues that do a lot of research on, on cannabis use, but I think understanding how some of these supplements and other, you know, forms of cannabis other than the sort of traditionally smoked uh, cannabis affect our brain's health is, is still a little bit unclear. I want to ask if there's been any research done on uh, aging among artists, whether that's visual artists or musicians. I, I'm sure there, there have been. Uh, I, I don't know uh, that body of literature. Uh, but what you do sort of bring to mind for me is uh, some very interesting research that's been done on patient populations, particularly patients with a particular form of dementia called a frontotemporal dementia, but also in patients with Alzheimer's disease where there is uh, suddenly where there has been none before this sort of like budding interest in, uh, in the arts and creating art uh, and sort of artistic, artistic ability. Uh, and so that, that is a really interesting body of research that suggests that maybe when some parts of our brain are compromised, even people who were never interested in engaging in the arts before have sort of a newly emerging interest in uh, uh, doing sort of artistic, artistic endeavors. So I think that's something that's, you know, important. I mean, it's not 
answering your question at all. Uh, but you know, uh, but it's you know, it's sort of on the outskirts of your question. But I think it's an important thing to keep in mind if we do have uh, relatives or friends that are experiencing memory loss or have been diagnosed with dementia, that even if they've sort of never been interested in these things before, introducing some of these artistic uh, activities may be something to something to try. And I, I can say, having done many years of work in skilled nursing facilities, um, that what is quite remarkable are the songs uh, that people have learned when they're very young, even with quite advanced cognitive decline, the songs are retained, mm -hmm. and the affect, the memories that are linked to those songs are maintained and are, are very, very important for older people. I would think that there would be some parallel with people who were visually inclined and their love of art and color and shapes and styles, clothes, um, can also elicit that and are also maintained well beyond the, the, the more uh, conversational kind of thing here. Keep the mask up. I first want to say I will be not I will be 91 in 16 days. I drove here. Thank you. And something I've learned about changing from like your 80s to your 90s or your 70s to 80s, it's traumatic to go from 70s to 80s. In other words, to turn it to a zero. Mm. It's traumatic. Screw 91, it doesn't make any difference at all. <laughs> it's just another year. And I'm driving, and last year, I went and took another driving test because I said to my kids, I'm taking another driving test, shut up. <laughs> and I do have um, a lot of medical and physical problems. Mm -hmm. The weather up here is a killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I lived for 25 years, three blocks on the beach in Santa Monica. By the way, I was a half a block from Whitey Bulger, who I never heard of. <laughs> and um, the, the weather definitely affects my emotions because it affects my physical being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I moved to a place where I could go swimming. And until I started all this physical stuff about eight years ago, I was swimming three times a week happily doing laps. And um, my doctor, my knee replacement surgery, the second one, just told me that I can start swimming again. Oh, great. I'm, I'm waiting for that. That's so that would help a lot. When also you're in a, um, if you live in a multicultural building mm. and it's doing, <laughs> it's under construction, that is a disaster mm. for your emotions and your mental status. Yeah. So try to go someplace if you are that isn't going to reconstruct. We, 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 we're fixing it up and making a lot of noise. <laughs> you have to check into that. And I, I think uh, you can demonstrate that a good sense of humor is a, a, an important uh, skill set and personality set to have when you're older or adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank Happy you, early Jim. birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one, one of your earlier slides talks about many of the different issues related to uh, cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And two specific ones that, that uh, caught my attention were related to attention. Uh, one was attention distraction. And I've forgotten what the other one is. But uh, <laughs> I think as a society, we, we think often about attention issues as being typical for teenagers, ADHD and other things. I wonder if uh, it's possible that some of the approaches that are used to help teenagers might be helpful for uh, adults. 
Y yes, absolutely. So, you know, one thing that we, so, so I guess, a, a, you know, a couple of different things about attention. Um, so you're right, we do often think about like attention deficit disorder when we think about the, you know, the domain of attention. But it turns out that uh, attention can be disrupted because of numerous, numerous things. So, you know, anybody that's ever had a poor night's sleep can sort of tell you, you know, that they're not able to pay attention as well the, the next day. Um, uh, if you're feeling anxious about something or sort of down in the dumps about something, you may have, you know, problems focusing on other things. So uh, having problems with attention is I incredibly non non-specific. Uh, but, uh, but we do often think about ADHD. And one of the things that we didn't get to talk as much about are sort of these uh, tips, tricks, strategies that, that we can use to help us to function as well as we can in, in everyday life. And certainly many of them are the same types of things that we might uh, use with individuals that have problems with attention, uh, teenagers or other people, adults with attention deficit disorder. So, you know, sort of creating structure, creating organization, using organizational aids, uh, you know, these things uh, that I mentioned, like, you know, making sure you have a, a memory bowl, we sometimes call it, or a key hook, someplace to, like, put things so you're not losing things, you know, all of the time. Um, those are all things that can be helpful for not only individuals who may be aging, but also, you know, individuals who may have weaknesses in some of these areas. Yeah. And we know that uh, attention is... Uh, going down with the, the lower cohorts of uh, the kids coming up have a shorter attention span. So those of us who are mature older adults um, actually have a, a, a baseline of uh, attention that is longer than our kids and our grandchildren are going to have. We don't know. We won't be here to see what happens when they get to be 90. Yes. Oh, two, two people to, excuse me. It's, it's like, I've got it. I have a okay. question too. When okay, you okay. Is there any way to reconcile <clears throat> the problem when exercise is so uh, important, really critical, with the body that also has problems mm -hmm. and that interferes with the maybe the desire, but maybe more the ability. So it becomes an excuse for not doing exercise. Yeah. And she can add to that if she wants. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so I think the motivation piece, you know, it, it's sort of a real, a real Part of this, uh, you know, it can be helpful to set really small and sort of specific goals to try to motivate oneself. It can be, you know, if I, I had time, there's a wonderful video that illustrates this. Uh, you know, I think it can be really important to think to yourself, you know, why is it important for me to age well? Why is it important for me to exercise? You know, maybe it's so that you can play with your grandkids. Maybe it's so you can, you know, take that trip to Italy that you, you know, that you've always wanted to take. So each individual person is going to have their own motivating factors. Uh, certainly, I think physical health and um, physical conditions that affect the body can be uh, can it can be difficult to sort of think about uh, how do I exercise with these physical conditions? We have uh, patients in our office that say, "Well, I can't exercise; I have back pain," or you know, "I can't exercise; my knee is bad." Uh, and we work with amputees that exercise. And so, what I usually say is, uh, most people can find a way to exercise their bodies to engage in physical activity. You need to find what works for you, given whatever limitations you, you may have. And so uh, for those folks, we refer people to our physical therapist, to our recreation therapist. We have them talk to their physicians about what they can do. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it is a very, very small minority of people who cannot exercise. So I would encourage people to have those kinds of conversations. Thank you. Do you typically, and would you be willing to, share your slides? Because my, my brain is slowing down, and I can't take notes as quickly as I once could. 
the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I probably need to sort of confer with some folks to mm -hmm. figure out what the best way of doing that might might be. You know, the other thing that I will say is this, you know, this seven steps to managing your aging memory book contains like all of the things I've been talking about today and more that I, I wasn't able to talk about. And I'm not saying that, you know, to try to get people to buy the book. There are also um, uh, copies, you know, that you can get for free in your local we'll libraries, we'll uh, library. you know, here. Uh, and so, um, you know, that that uh, probably is a more robust source than my slides are of, you know, of all the information. And, and I think um, for those, uh, the, the Needham TV channel will also be covering, repeating this, so you can take notes from that. Yes, one more question, okay? And that's it. Hi, I was curious as to whether you can speak to any correlation between hearing loss and aging brain. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I would, I would say that one thing that comes up for us uh, quite often is, you know, how much hearing loss might be interfering with people's ability to learn new information. To you know, if you can't hear what somebody is telling you, there's like no chance that you're going to remember that later on. Uh, if you're having difficulty following a conversation when people are speaking because of hearing loss, you know, you're going to feel confused. Uh, again, you're going to have difficulties remembering those sorts of things later on. So it, it is very important uh, for us to make sure that the patients that we see are um, have had updated the audiology exams, that, you know, if they're reluctant to wear their hearing aids, we understand why, that we refer them back to audiology to uh, get updated exams or get a new exam if they haven't had one, to get appropriately fitting hearing aids, uh, and also to be able, I mean, same thing with vision, to be able, um, you know, to know that they are seeing uh, appropriately, that their vision is appropriately corrected. So those are the types of uh, things that I think about when I think about hearing loss and its relationship to memory. It, it really interferes with the socialization um, a lot. And so, and then there's uh, the, the impression that when we get older, things move more slowly. Like, um, for example, the hearing aids may need to be actually changed and monitored and the, and the gla eyeglasses as well more frequently when you're older than when you're a younger person. It's kind of... Uh, Thank you so, so much. What a wonderful one. Thank you all. Thank you really. so much. Terrific, terrific. Thank you.